the moment you've all been waiting for. You're tuned in to Tapped Out. Hosted by Brendan Tobin and Sean Levine. Only on the BetQL Network. Good Saturday evening. We appreciate you checking us out here on the BetQL Network. Let's talk some fighting and let's make some money. With Brendan Tobin, I'm the sports machine, Sean Levine. And the fights inside the octagon are going on as we speak from St. Louis, Missouri. And dude, so far, we've seen some good ones. Just now, Chase Hooper basically came into the fight even money against Vaclav Borshev. And dude, I have I haven't seen a one-sided fight like that in a long time. It finished with Chase the Dream Hooper by sub in the second round. Dude, if you were scoring that fight, it would have been 10-7, 10-8. Chase Hooper almost knocked him out four times and almost choked him out five times. That was crazy. Yeah, very dominant performance from the Dream. Uh, you could have gotten if you had him at sub. It was uh, three to one. It paid. Little controversy with the ending, but I think uh, Keith Peterson ultimately uh, did him a favor because I mean it was a pretty bad whooping that Borchev was taking. I mean he was he had a, he had another planet growing on his bald dome by the end of it. So he might have been it might have been a flail tap, but it was probably heading that way anyway. It was a great performance by Chase Hooper. Gives the call out to Patty the Batty afterwards. They won't give it. They they won't give him Patty the Batty. No guts. No guts to give Chase Hooper their Patty the Batty. But you know, for him, a a you know classic grappling maestro. He's been doing that since he was uh, since he basically could walk. It comes out with just a, a bang left hand to, to drop Borchev early, and that was all she wrote. I mean, he he basically wrote him like a spider monkey the rest of the fight and threw elbows and punch in his face. Uh, Keith Peterson was very generous, too. Probably could have stopped it a bunch of times. That hematoma that he put on Borshev, I mean, I haven't seen one like that since the boogie woman, Joanna Ojacek, looked like she had a second planet growing off of her forehead. Uh, why won't they give him Patty the Batty? It seems like if you match oh, up God, the Batty dude, the dream, not... that'll build up Come a on. star. Why not? Come on, dude. They're not going to get... They, they don't have the guts to give Chase Hooper... Patty the Batty. They don't want to. They, they, they're going to protect Patty the Batty. They're going to keep him from some young lion who looks like he's coming into his own. I mean, honestly, if you give Chase Hooper a little bit of striking, this guy is so dangerous on the ground uh, with those long limbs, those that that that, that grappling ability. Listen, I know that's what they say is, is Patty's calling card. All right, let's see you do it then. Let's see this guy get tested. Enough throwing him old men. Enough throwing, enough throwing him shorties. Go in there with another young dog. And let's see what it's what, he, what he's got going. But they won't do it. Come on, dude. You know they won't. It's crazy. He's only 24 years old. We've been talking about Chase Hooper now for quite a while. He looks like he's about 14 years old. Uh, I don't want to sell short the fight before when Esteban Rimovich slept Terrence McKinney with a head kick to the face. I mean, he put Terrence McKinney to sleep. That was basically an even money fight, too. Dude sent T-Rex back to Jurassic Park, man. That was a uh, that was a hell of a blast right there from the gringo. Woo! <laughs> So before we get into the Bruce Leroy, Alex Caceres fight, I know which side you're on. That's your boy. What's this first fight that's coming up? Don't that say you that. You know, I can, I, no, I, I, I'm, I'm a very fair and partial person. You know, you don't know what I'm, I'm going to pick, dude. You're really not. I, I know I know what you do. You bet with your heart sometimes. You're definitely going to tell us that Bruce Leroy is going to knock him out. But what's the fight before that you keep talking about with Jake? All right, so you got Waldo Cortez Acosta. He's stepping in there against Robles uh, Despagne, who, if you guys haven't seen him, he last fought, made his UFC debut at 299 in Miami, which, of course, you know, you're going to have the, uh, the the Cuban freak, you know, make his debut in Miami. But, Makes dude, sense. like, these are his these are his finish times, all right? He's 5-0, and oh, um, you know, as it is with, with, with a lot of Cubans. They say he's 35. I don't really know what his age is. Ish, you know, you got to do a little... It can be questionable, but these are his finish times for his last four fights, dude. All right. He's never been out of the first round, but his last four after going one and oh, where it went nearly to the end in Titan FC, uh, his last fights, 12 seconds, three seconds, four seconds and Whoa. 18 seconds. What? Yeah. That sounds like a misprint. So you're telling me this dude has never been in a fight that's lasted longer than 20 seconds. Uh, he's been in one in his debut. The rest of them haven't even lasted 30 seconds. The longest has gone under 20 seconds. Never so, anything like that. He's worked now, so well, all bet and done in one, right? I mean, that's easy I money. Mean, look, 
Cortez Acosta has never been finished. He's uh, he's eleven and one in his career. So I guess they're gonna beef up his competition, which they should, to see if this guy's the real deal. But I'm telling you, man. Well, first of all, he's a mon. I mean, Sean, this guy steps into the cage. We all saw him there, and I'm like, he's taller than the cage. It's kind of like one of those. He's six seven, uh, just a, a monster striker, taekwondo, you know, Olympian, just a complete freak. But I mean, we don't really know. I mean, he's never been tested. We've never been clipped. It is heavyweight. You got to be a little bit wary of that stuff. But yeah, his finish times have been insane since he's uh, since in, in his fighting career. Well, now I'm a little bit upset that I didn't drive the four and a half hours to St. Louis to see this monster of a man. All right, well, you got me excited. I know where your money's going. Just tell everybody right now, Alex Caceres is an underdog, which kind of surprises me. Not only a dog, plus 190 against Sean Woodson, who obviously can beat you in a bunch of different ways. A heavy favorite at minus 225. Say some nice stuff about your boy, Bruce Leroy. Well, I just like him as a dog. You know, look, he's had a thing in his. I just like him. As, I like his value in his dog. It's it, as a dog. It's always been a thing with him where it's like it feels when he's kind of your classic gatekeeper. You know, whenever sure. they throw him in there with like somebody who's on the up and up, like Sean Woodson has been, and he's been fighting well lately. Anytime they do that, it seems like you know that is where Bruce Leroy flourishes. But like when he goes in there with guys with a little bit of a name, that's probably where he peters out so every time you feel like you count him out and i get it, you know they're gonna give sean woodson the, the hometown role everybody thinks he's gonna win eh, that's where exactly where bruce leroy gets you where he wants and so i'm sorry dude two to one i'm not gonna i'm gonna turn that down with blue bruce leroy going into this one not me dude sorry i you can call dude. me bias if you want to call me bias if you want to but I, that's just how i'm going I got worse stuff to call you than bias. I'm just saying we all knew where you were going. But I do agree with what you were saying about Alex Caceres. Kind of Bobby Greenish as far as his career has gone, where yeah. I don't think he was ever going to be that close to a title, but he's always fun to watch, and he's a big name, and he's exciting. And I do like him at 2-1 to one underdog money right now at Bet MGM. There's another dog in a fight, Alonzo Menafield plus 225. I'm not surprised, again, that he's the underdog. But you're going to give me more than two to one against Carlos Olberg. Where's your money going in that fight? <sighs> that one's a little bit dicier to me. You know, I mean, yeah, Menafield is definitely always live because he's got some pop. But I mean, Olberg's been—I mean, he's been steamrolling, dude. He has been—he has been finishing everybody he steps in there with. He has been an absolute freak monster. Um, so I get that one a little bit more. I mean, Menafield always has got the chance to hammer you and. And, and give you that so like if you're just basing it off of hey dude's got experience i'll throw it down on his hands and we got something but i mean we're talking what one two three four straight finishes for uber going into this one so i i'm probably gonna rock with that on the early leans for tonight as we get into the middle of this card i'm actually thinking about going the other way in that one although it is tempting to play the underdog menafield at plus 225 Olberg by knockout looks pretty tasty to me all right, let's work our way up this St. Louis card, getting our way to the main event. Joaquin Buckley, of course, has a bunch of highlight knockouts taking on uh, Rizabov tonight at plus 105. Where's your money going to the co-main event in St. Louis? This is a tough one because it's like, I mean, Buckley's been calling for this fight. This is like his hometown. Um, and by the way, shame on us for all that uh, when we were doing the knockouts and best knockouts of all time we didn't we failed to mention joaquin buckley i mean this guy might have i know the stakes aren't the same he might have the greatest knockout of all time with uh with his little video game spinning back kick i mean that is i mean that's that's an all-timer and of, uh, of all the talks i that that that's shame on us i apologize i'll take the blame on it because i should mention it you know it was there yeah, but i was you. like oh yeah joaquin buckley my god what what an absolute monster but uh um, yeah, yeah but, i think i'm gonna lean with it he's been called Real, real quick, though, I think that actually we got all those right because think about all the other ones we said. We were talking about Ronda Rousey, pay-per-view for the belt. We were talking about Leon and Usman, pay-per-view for the belt. We were talking about Mazdal and Ben Askren, huge pay-per-view. That Everybody's watching that card. So if we're just talking about – if you don't know anything about fighting and you're just watching highlights in the background of dudes knocking out others, maybe – Maybe we need to put Joaquin Buckley on there. But as far as big knockouts per the situation, and the whole reason it came up was because we were asking, where does the Max Holloway 
knockout of Justin Gaethje in the BMF fight rank. Now that it's kind of in my rearview mirror, I still have it top 10 all the time. But I, you really think we disrespected Joaquin Buckley by not putting him on a list like that? I think we got it right. I do. Dude, okay. a, a spinning jump back kick to the face. Cuckoosh! Falling okay. straight down. What are we talking about? That was an insane knockout. Anyway, I, I think I'm going to go with him. I think if we're going hometown roll, uh, I will not uh, I will not give that to Sean Woodson based on my bias, but I will give it to Joaquin Buckley. I say that he gets the win tonight by knockout. Brendan Tobin, sports machine, Sean Levine, talking a little fighting here on the BetQL Network. That was a little Detroit lean to the left you just did there. Did you just almost fall out of your chair? It looked like you almost, almost did. dude. Almost. almost. Oh, I wouldn't I would have been so this is a counter height chair too. It, it would have been a bit of a uh, a bit of a drop for me. I've got the chair by knockout at plus five hundred, so I wish that would have happened. Speaking of knockouts, Derek Lewis in the main event in St. Louis tonight, taking on Hogerio Nascimento. I probably didn't say that right. Plus one thirty five. Derek Lewis, the favorite, at minus one sixty five. Obviously, this fan is huge fans. This show, I should say, huge fans of the Black Beast. We love him inside the octagon, watching him knock people out on the microphone. If he's taking off his pants, if he's kneeing dudes in the face like we saw not that long ago, Derek Lewis at minus 165. I've had to pay more for him, BT. I'm willing to pay that number. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I mean, you know, on this show, when we're talking uh, on talk, we're talking about bias betting. I'm not betting against Derek Lewis, especially you, don't. you know you won't. these these fight these fight nights where it's like it's it's like oh, all right, are we writing him off. I get it. His record can look dicey, and you're always sitting here, and you're like, ah, oh, this is the time to write him off. But then it's like, oh, but then it's not because he'll just throw out a haymaker. And you're all of a sudden being like, ah, oh, yeah, I should have, what, why didn't I throw a little bit of something on Derek Lewis uh, by knockout, which is not a lot of value in it tonight. So you probably want to like parlay because that's one of the more popular thing that's out there as far as odds are concerned for tonight's finish. But come on, dude. I mean, like even with him, uh, you know, peaky pooing around 40 years old, guys just got an absolute hammer. And especially in that first round, you're just going to be sitting there with bated breath. And even when he's not, it's 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 always wondering when is he gonna just uncork one to finish off the fight. So, uh, yeah, I'm gonna go with the Black Beast tonight. Over the last couple of years, we've had some almost champion fan favorites retire. Like Tony Ferguson comes to mind, and uh, and I guess that's a little disrespectful to say almost champion. Tony's a champion. That's El Kikui. Uh, You know, Cowboy Cerrone, those type of guys, and. I think he follows in that suit. How much longer do you think we have with Derek Lewis? Because you mentioned his age. He's like 39 years old. I would struggle with this because, like, there's more cards than ever. Like, Edson Barbosa is the main event of next week. And so you're telling me as long as Derek Lewis wants to, are they never going to just not throw him on a fight night main event just to have Derek Lewis there? It's always tough to gauge when they should retire and when will they retire. Because, yeah, if he lost tonight and you're talking, like, four out of five, you're probably thinking to yourself, yeah, probably is the time where we should uh, we should hang this up. But um, you know, that's it's a it's a it's a UFC that needs to to fill a lot of void. So I am always hesitant to just throw. Oh yeah, yeah, he'll he'll definitely retire, even if it's uh, what I guess it would be five out of six losses if he lost tonight. That's the thing, though, is some of these guys, as you point out, they're always going to fill arenas. People are going to get in front of their television set. Do you have a favorite Black Beast moment? Because there's a lot that come to mind. And the best thing about him is his fights save the Nganu one. It, they're always good. E even when he ends up getting knocked out, and that happens sometimes, too, it feels like he's been in mostly entertaining fights. Uh, probably Volkov, just because it was such a Hail Mary. Like that's the that one that crazy. I'm just, uh, yeah. I, the 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 fact that he was able to just kind of pull that one from from out of nowhere, you're that was definitely the one where you're just thinking to yourself like this guy, you really you legitimately never can count him out of a fight. Like you'll say that for most people, and it's like kind of cliche, but for him, it's actually true. He can basically pull one out at any point, and you're just like, yeah, all right, that makes sense. He's got that kind of a uh, crazy knock your socks off power. Most of the time when guys this big step into the cage, it doesn't go more than a round in a half. 
I actually don't think this one goes past one. I'm tempted to play gone in 60 with Derek Lewis because a couple of times he'll come out trying to knock a dude out flying across the octagon all of a sudden like he's George Masvidal and he sees Ben Askren on the other side. I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of money on that. As you mentioned, you can't get paid too much on Derek Lewis by knockout. You kind of have to parlay it. So I think I'm looking at Derek Lewis by second round knockout in the main event. All right, we'll keep talking fighting on the other side. We welcome on a new guest, a new friend of the show. He is Jason Hagholm, and he joins us right here on the BetQL Network. Or tapped out with Brendan Tobin and Sean Levine on the BetQL Network. Hopefully you're having a good Saturday night and making some money. Welcome back into Tapped Out with Brendan Tobin. I am indeed the sports machine, Sean Levine. BT rocking his Florida Panthers shirt. Uh, BT, do you actually come across Panthers down in Florida? I know alligators and iguanas are like a real problem. Huge comeback with the Florida Panther, dude, because they introduced Texas Pumas down here to kind of rebirth the uh, population. So uh, I have never come across one live, but the population, they say, is booming the more you know. See, we don't just talk fighting. We talk a little wildlife here. Mama always told me you're never too old to make new friends, so let's welcome a new friend of the show. MMA journalist Jason Hagholm joins us, and we're watching the fights along with you. And, dude, there have been a couple of crazy ones. Terrence McKinney got kicked in the face. That was a crazy knockout. Chase Hooper looked unbelievable. If we're going for an early fight of the night, based on what we've seen so far, what are you leaning towards? I think you got to lean that Billy Goff and the Waters fight. That fight was incredible. Was just too. really all gas, no heart, really for both guys, just throwing everything they had. I mean, you know it's a good fight when after the first round, Dana White goes on Instagram Live and says he should give both uh, Waters and Goff $20,000 as a bonus just for that first round. Like Dana was in love with it, then you know it was a really good fight. I mean, it got, it got the crowd going in St. Louis, which is a positive because those first couple fights were a little slow to start the night out. Yeah, it, it, you know what? I would love the idea of Dana White just going and throwing cash in the middle of the corner. I think that should be like the new way to do it. Like immediate, <laughs> immediate reaction to her shot. Like it just has like a a, a almost like a, a, a like a Russian mob feel. Just be like, yeah, twenty thousand. That was amazing. Here we go out there. <laughs> uh, from uh, this standpoint, Chase Hooper looked really, really good in his performance. Calls out Patty the Batty uh, subtly in his uh, post fight press conference. How, how do you like that matchup, Jason? Do you feel like uh, that's too much for? Patty Pimblett to take on, or uh, do you like that matchup with the two uh, the two young bucks going at it? I like that fight a lot. I mean, Chase Hooper looked incredible. I didn't ex I expected a good performance from Chase Hooper, but I didn't expect him to blow away Slava Claus the way that he did with the dropping with the first punch, controlling on the ground, having that, and then eventually getting the submission in the second round. And the sub to call out of Patty, I liked as well. Um, if that fight were to get made, I don't think MMA Twitter could handle it. I just think that's one that would just blow up the stratosphere with the 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 fan base that ha Patty has and the the ability that Chase has to have a following there on uh, the MMA Twitter that side I like that fight a lot I mean I, I I want I'd like to see it and why not why why not reward Hooper for uh, a game opponent after performance like that BT why are you so hell bent that that fight's not going to happen because everything that Jason just said if it would blow up MMA Twitter and it's not like we're talking about two top ten fighters or anything like that why not make it happen. They don't. I don't just don't think they're gonna. I, I feel like that that gets Patty Pimblett in dangerous waters, dude. I feel like Chase Hooper is gonna embarrass him. That's what I think. I'm not trying to be a Patty the Batty hater, but I just think that that adorable little nerd is gonna like. He's gonna do something that's gonna end the whole hype train that is Patty Pimblett. You might be right. That Chase Hooper beatdown. I mean, that was a beatdown that I just saw. We're talking with Jason Hagholm here on the BetQL Network. We're trying to make some money on this card. Some pretty big names coming up in St. Louis. Still to fight Alonzo Menafield, Joaquin Buckley, Black Beast, Derek Lewis. Which fighter do you feel most confident about in the fights coming up? Ooh, that's a good. I honestly would go feel with uh, in the co-main event in uh, Ruzabayev against Joaquin Buckley. I feel like Buckley, he's riding this momentum and everything like that. But that's a tough ask here for Buckley in his hometown to put on a big performance. And this feels kind of in some ways, maybe a bit of a punishment from Dana White for maybe Buckley annoying him at that press conference a little bit while ago. I mean, Ruzabayev is 
an incredible fighter in his own right here. 2-0 in the UFC with both wins coming by a first-round finish. I, I would feel confident in uh, Ruzubayev coming through and getting a win here against Joaquin Buckley and, and silencing the crowd in St. Louis. Uh, what about in the main event, Jason? Uh, Derek Lewis, we were talking a little about this one uh, before – you got on with us, uh, you know, if he loses tonight, that's five out of six. I don't know how much he has left in the tank, but I never can rule him out. I'm too uh, too much of a fanboy to ever rule against Derek Lewis. How do you like his chances tonight? I think he's got to get it done in the first round. If this fight sees a second round or even longer, that's when I think Nascimento can put this one away. Um, Nascimento's got a tank. Obviously, when you look at his track record in the UFC, he's picked up mostly decision victories, including some split decisions over uh, uh, Ilir Latifi and fellow Canadian of mine, uh, Tanner Boser. But I, I think he, uh, I think Nascimento here's got to find a way to get this fight out of the first round, and then he can really control the fight and maybe right out of the decision or put away Lewis because what we've seen with Lewis is once these fights go longer, his, his gas tank starts to run out and his will starts to break a little bit. Jason, you obviously know your stuff. So you've proven that now we just got to break you down a little bit, get to know you. And I'm not going to ask a question, just general your thoughts when it comes to Sugar Sean O'Malley. Hey, Sugar Sean O'Malley, you know what? You may not like some of his antics, and he wears some ridiculous outfits, but the guy is an incredible fighter and someone that the UFC obviously sees something in since he had that contender series fight back on season one. I mean, they're marketing him. They're putting finishes of when he wins titles out on social media for everyone to see. They're putting him with uh, Dana White at the Tom roast of Tom Brady on Netflix last weekend. Like, they believe he can be the, the, the star, star that the UFC needs. And let's face it, the UFC needs some stars right now so i'm yeah. not gonna hate on what sean o'malley brings to the table his fighting style is incredible uh, what especially with that performance just a few months ago at uc 299 against cheeto vera so i like sean o'malley he's fighting in a deadly division as he's and he is the champion and you know what the ufc needs stars so i'm all about sean o'malley uh old stars have been uh back in the news this week jason john jones has found his twitter thumbs again he has been very active on social media and uh, we have gone from, you know, Aspinall to Pajeda to now it seems like we're here. We're circling back to the original plan of him fighting Stipe next. So uh, GOAT versus heavyweight GOAT. If you had your ways of John Jones, what, who would you like to see him fight next? What interests you the most? Well, I think it's the Aspinall fight. I mean, why have Aspinall be this interim champion if he can't fight the actual champion? That's the one I want to see. I think everyone wants to see him have that fight because that's a heavyweight they feel that can really push him whereas you know stipe's definitely maybe his better days are behind him uh i obviously if he wants to fight you know uh, the current light heavyweight champion here in pajera that would obviously be at heavyweight but let's fight aspinall aspinall someone that deserves it he's been wanting it and yeah we don't need john jones tweeting anymore please for the love of goodness someone take his phone away if we're talking John Jones, superstar, some uh, questionable outside the octagon activities, the next question seems to always involve Conor McGregor, so I'll just go there. He is back. We think we're going to see him, his return in a couple of months versus Michael Chandler. That fight probably goes off ultimately at Bet MGM, pretty close to even money. Jason, where's your money going that night? I would lean towards Michael Chandler. I feel like this is the moment he's been waiting for. He's been in camps. He's been active enough training around waiting for this fight. Whereas there's Connor who, you know, he is training, but, you know, he just signed this deal to, you know, take over, you know, part management of BKFC. He's just had a movie come out. Like how serious or how much even time training is he going to be affected for a guy who's, Mind is 24 hours a day, 365 on mixed martial arts in Michael Chandler. I feel like Chandler's waited for this moment. He's going to thrive in it because connor has got so many other opportunities here in the realm of, of, of combat sports, with, whether it's with BKFC or whatever he wants to do uh, post that. I, I think Chandler needs this fight for himself to really solidify his legacy where Connor's legacy is already uh, you know, done for. A guy who uh, maybe, I mean, you know, could jump into a, a title talk if Connor does get a win. You know, in a couple of weeks, we have uh, UFC 301 with or 302 with uh, Islam versus Dustin Poirier. How much of a shot you give him Poirier in this one? It's kind of probably his last crack at the belt. Islam has shown some vulnerabilities as a champion. Definitely hasn't been as as dominant as his uh, his big bro Khabib has been, but. Uh, do you feel Dustin has a shot in this one? Because the odds obviously very leaning 
towards Islam. So uh, if you if you had a little scratch to throw on this one, would you see the value in playing a Dustin Poirier, or do you feel like Islam is has got the blueprint to take him out? I would put some money here on Dustin Poirier because I think we're going to see the best version of Dustin Poirier that we can at this stage because he probably knows he can't climb himself up the mountaintop one more time as he's done it countless times in, in his career to you know get win an interim title fight for this lightweight title against khabib now get this opportunity again here where he thought it was over after the loss to gaichi last year i would i think we're going to see the best version here of dustin Poirier to do whatever's in his power to come away with this uh ufc lightweight championship a title that's eluded him for such a long period of time and if he wins maybe one more fight if not i could he could even maybe retire holding that belt because that's been his ultimate goal here though probably would have one more fight because UFC obviously hates when you win a title and then retire but I would put some money here on Poirier because I think you can follow some things from the first Volkanovski fight over to this camp uh, for this fight I think there's a chance here for Dustin Poirier it's on U.S. soil too that I think helps him out a lot where the Khabib fight was out in uh, in the Abu Dhabi I-, I would put some money here on Dustin Poirier I, I think we all just want to see Dustin Poirier maybe win this title Definitely. here for all he's done for the sport and one of the best people in mixed martial arts. Especially at those odds. Last time I saw him, he was like 3-1, to 4-1. to one. I mean, feed me Dustin Poirier that night. By the way, a real good way to get kicked off this show is to say bad stuff about Dustin Poirier to Brendan Tobin. So good job <laughs> with that one. You get to stay around. That's our guy. Um, What about Max Holloway, the new BMF? What makes the most sense for his next fight? I want to see Max versus Ilya Taporia. I think after their last two performances, I think I would love to see that fight. I think their styles just mesh for just this incredible fight of the year candidate, incredible style fight. They're now barking at each other through social media. So there seems to be some validity in that. Um, that's where I want to see Max Holloway go. If he can make the cut back to 145, though, obviously he seemed to like 155. He could be a name in the mix, but I think right now he wants that shot at Taporia and to really solidify himself one more time is like one of the, if not the greatest featherweight of all time. What have you made of uh, how Taporia has acted since winning uh, the title? I know he's taken some critiques on that. Have you been fine with it? Uh, the idea that he's uh, maybe been a, a little bit too cocky. There's been talks. Did he turn down a Volkanovsky fight? I mean, what have you just made about his reign thus far uh, leading up to his first defense when he does get to uh, to put his belt on the line? I've been very fine with it. I mean, look, the man brought the title to uh, what a Real Madrid soccer game, which is like the biggest thing you can, like one of the biggest moments, I think, for a mixed martial artist outside of the, the MMA bubble. It was one of the coolest moments. You know, he's enjoyed the fruits of his labor becoming the champion, you know, parading that featherweight championship around Europe. Um, sure, you know what, he is the champion, but he openly said he would turn down some fights. Because, wait, he is the champion. He has that power. Uh, he has the ability to do that, and he's waiting for maybe that big fight that can happen in Spain at the Bernabeu where uh, Real Madrid play. I think that's what he's hoping for. He's hoping for the biggest payday possible. And I would think right now after that performance from Max Holloway at UFC 300 with that incredible knockout with a second left in the fifth round, go for go for that if you're the UFC. They love that. What a way to enter a new market like Spain with uh, a Spanish champion against one of the biggest names that the sport has. Talk a little fighting with Jason Hagholm here on the BetQL Network. Jason, we've got a Hamzad Jemayev sighting, which is pretty rare, actually. Uh, he'll step back in the octagon against Robert Whitaker. Who you got in that fight? And do you think we really know yet how good Hamzad really is? I think we may have seen some of those holes in the game from Hamzad. Like, he looked like this world beater could just destroy you in one round, but... Then the Gilbert Byrne fights happens, and you can see some holes once the fights go the distance. And didn't look that great against Kamara Usman here. I mean, Robert Whitaker, he's just been a staple at middleweight forever. So I wouldn't hate putting some money on Robert Whitaker because I think we may have seen what uh, Hamzat Chemaev is. He may he could just be like a, a force in one round, but if you can survive him in one round, you can be able to push the, the pace to him. And Whitaker's a guy that can hit hard and has that big fight experience. I would maybe lean a little bit on Whitaker, but yeah, it's been, it's weird how we haven't seen much of Hamzat uh, over the past little bit here. Jason, uh, turn it back to last week. Were you uh, more impressed with uh, Steve Ursick in his first, you know, real big stage fight play, uh, fighting? Some people thought that he got robbed in the, uh, in the championship fight. Were you most impressed with his performance in the championship fight or were you more impressed that 
Jose Aldo, two years out of the cage, uh, doing what he's able to do, still looks like he's uh, got something left in the tank. I'm impressed with both, actually. Like, for Aldo to have that performance when, you know, he retired, you thought maybe he thought it was, you know, too much for him in his career, but he's he had some of those boxing fights out in Brazil. Maybe that reignited the fire for him, and he just looked like the Aldo of old, shutting down a real top contender at Bantamweight and Jonathan Martinez, you know, won that fight on the scorecards 30-27 across the board. Last fight of his deal, so I'm very interested to see what can happen with him going forward. Uh, I would assume maybe the UFC is going to throw a big play at him. They already put him in number eight in the Bantamweight division rankings this week, so maybe that's a little tip your hat, like something that the UFC is interested in. But for Ursek, I mean, this guy fought an incredible fight, took the fight to Pantoja, made a calculated mistake in that fifth round going for the takedown that ultimately cost him the fight. Um, but this is a guy that knows that if I get back, seems to know that when he gets back there, he won't make those mistakes again. And he, he was able to put on a great performance against Pantoja, who's, you know, got himself a nice title defense here and has added some stability at this flyweight division after we had the uh, Figueredo and Moreno uh, hot potatoing of that belt for about two years. I actually had Astro Boy winning that fight, but that's where my money was. I'm bitter like I always am. Jason Hagholm, great stuff, talking some fighting with us here on the BetQL Network. Sean Levine on the BetQL Network. And we roll along this Saturday night. Welcome back into the show. It is tapped out here on the BetQL Network. BT, you are uh, fresh back from Las Vegas. You got a chance to see in person Canelo Alvarez versus Jaime Manguia. That one kind of went the way that most of us thought. Before we get there, let's talk about the big fight tonight. Vasily Lomachenko, Lomo back in the ring against George Ferocious Cambosis. A little bit surprised to see how big of an underdog Cambosis is. Damn near 5-1 to one at Bet MGM. Right now he's plus 450. Lomo's minus 700. Are you willing to pay that much for the favorite? Oh, man. Not on the money line. I think if you're going to go, the smartest decision probably is. I know you hate this, but the most, you know, probably the most boring thing is Lomachenko by decision because Cambosis has never been finished. Um, but he has, but man, I tell you, since he won the belt and he became, you know, the unified lightweight champion, shocking everybody, beating Teofimo Lopez. You know, he got skunked by Devin Haney in back-to-back -back fights. His last fight against Maxi Hughes wasn't very impressive. Uh, no beef here, but he did stop training down here in South Florida. I don't know if that had anything to do with his performances going down. Um, and so, I don't know. I just don't see how he gets it done tonight unless he knocks out Vasily Lomachenko. He's not really a knockout artist. And I could see George Cambosis, who can get a little bit gun-shy in fights. Um I can see him getting flushed pretty early on. So if he's going to have a shot in this fight, he's really got to make a statement to Lomachenko early. And I'm talking like rounds one through three. I don't know if he has to knock him down, but he's got to really, really hurt him to, to, to get everybody's mind to change on this fight. Because otherwise, it feels like we're teeing up Lomachenko to, to set himself up for a matchup with Shakur Stevenson later on in the year. That'd be great. How does everything always come back to South Beach with you? I mean, I get it. You're down there in Miami, but it's not the center of the universe. I actually Googled that the other day. It's like 10 minutes from where I live here in Kansas City. In fairness, in fairness he doesn't train in South Beach. You know, he trains oh. in Broward County in Davie, which is kind of a horse town. You know, it's like a little western town. It's, it's, a, it's very quaint. A horse town? I don't go through many horse towns. Not as many as you'd think living here. In the Midwest. I can't believe there's horse towns that live there down there in Florida. All right, let's talk about the fight you were at last week. Canelo took out Jaime Manguia. Again, fight was fun. Kind of went the way that most people thought was going to. I think the question now is, how much gas is left for Canelo? Is he still the face of boxing? And what's next? Um, I think he has a lot of gas left. I definitely think that that was a rejuvenating performance for him because, you know, like you said, most of us thought Munguia was going to come out strong. Could he actually hurt Canelo? The answer to that is no. I think that's probably the one thing you can marvel about Canelo's career out of this is like, man, how does anybody not hurt this guy? He goes in there. He's basically putting his uh, – he's going and he's coming forward. So it's right there for anybody to to really chin check him, and nobody's been able to do it. People have been able to outbox him, and people have been able to have – Nice performances, you know, winning on the scorecards, but but you really have not seen him 
in danger in many, many fights. So I thought that he looks like he has a lot of gas in the tank left for his age. Um, you know, for for people who uh, criticized him taking this fight as far as like the least interesting between Benavidez and Terrence Crawford, it was an entertaining fight. It was definitely an entertaining fight. It, it had its moments and props to Munguia for not getting demoralized after taking that uppercut and hitting the hitting the canvas in the fourth round. He was able to uh, still be game and, and make it a uh, crazy round. I will tell you one thing that was weird, Sean, about being in the building. Um, it was Cinco de Mayo weekend, as you know. Both of them are from Mexico. A lot more, uh, a lot more Munguia chance than there were Canelo chance. I thought that was weird. That is weird. That must have been a hell of a fun place to be. Um, what are the chances that we see a Canelo Bud Crawford fight anytime soon? Because that feels almost as big as Pacquiao Mayweather as long as they don't screw it up and do it three, four years too late. Yeah, I mean, like, th there was talk this week. Saudi Arabia really is interested in putting that fight together. And I think that, look, Canelo's no dummy. He has seen the paydays that Tyson Fury has gotten. He has seen the paydays that a lot of those heavyweights have gotten to go over there. And I think he wants in. He wants in on the business. So, with him saying that he's not going to fight a David Benavidez unless it's for $200 million, unless it's – and he's not going to fight a Terrence Crawford because there's no win. I, I don't think Canelo is afraid of fighting anybody. This guy, you could say a lot of things about him. He hasn't really ducked many people in his career. He's got a hell of a resume. Um, he's not the most perfect fighter, but he's not ducking anybody. But he is a businessman, and I think that he wants to get a crazy check to fight Terrence Crawford or David Benavidez. And it seems like, based on what Saudi Arabia is saying, is that the Crawford fight is the more likely path. As long as Crawford gets his win later this uh, this this uh, this summer, maybe we are headed towards that. The interesting thing, though, is it'll probably be towards the end of the year rather than September when Canelo normally fights. What would the odds look like for that fight if we see, let's call it, in the next year, neutral territory? Because right now, pound for pound for what it's worth, Bud Crawford's number one. I think the Monster's number two. I believe, I just checked this yesterday, I should remember this, Canelo's at number four, so we're talking about if the fight was to go down, it could be one versus two, one versus three. What would the odds look like? I assume Terrence Crawford would be a slight favorite. You know what? I was going to you know, be a coward and say pick him. Like, I feel like it's going to open up with Canelo, either a slight favorite to it being a pick him, but I think as the fight gets closer... I do think it will be a Terrence Crawford, you know, getting the majority of the money and, and ending up being the favorite by fight night. But when it opens up, I, I kind of think because of the weight difference um, that people, that the initial odds makers will will put the favoritism and, and make Bud a, a dog, trying to, you know, get the action spring into it. But I think by fight night, I think Terrence Crawford will be the favorite just because people will question Canelo's, Alvar uh, Canelo's ability to take on, you know, pure boxers and, you know, Bud's not even just a pure boxer. He's a guy who is a a, a, a power puncher for his weight class, but he is going to be going up three weight classes, essentially. I'm with those sharps that get in late. I think Bud Crawford will win the fight. I just hope we get a chance to see it. What we will see next week is the return of Tyson Fury. The last time we saw him, at least against Francis and Ganu, you and I both think Ganu won the fight, which has to be somewhat embarrassing for Tyson Fury, who came in as like a 15-1 to favorite or something like that. Uh, he fights Usyk. Usyk's actually favored to win this fight next Saturday night. It's tempting to not play Tyson Fury as a slight underdog. Yeah, I like Tyson as a dog. I like him even more by decision, which is like around two to one right now. I just think that, look, he's never been a big knockout artist in his career. Usyk has obviously, you know, been super durable. There hasn't been a lot of vulnerabilities. The guy has won under, uh, nearly won. He won the undisputed championship. Uh, a weight class below, and then if he wins tonight, he'll become the first heavyweight undisputed champion in years. So this uh, this is definitely a, a tough test for Tyson Fury because we want to know like how serious is he taking it. If you go on body, it looks like he's taking it a lot more seriously, but he is a lot bigger. Usyk has shown some vulnerabilities like uh, against Anthony Joshua. I just don't think AJ was really in the space to take advantage of him uh, like Tyson Fury could be. But look... You aren't, you're not wrong. I mean, like, the last image that we have of him was against Francis Ngannou. He looked flat-out awful. And then we saw what AJ looked like against Francis Ngannou, and it looked like it should, which is 
Francis Ngannou didn't look like he belonged in a boxing ring. So it's it's impossible for that not to raise questions about desire. How hard is he training? Uh, Tyson Fury has been a guy who's always talked about, you know, the mental wear and tear that this sport has taken on him, that life takes on him. So you're, you, yeah, there's, a, there's some questions about what Tyson Fury are we getting next week when they step in the ring with each other? He looks great. I mean, physically, he never really comes in with a six pack or anything like that, but he looked especially bad, I thought, physically, almost like maybe he wasn't taking it quite as seriously as ultimately found out he should have against Francis Ngannou. It looks the opposite. Like, I saw some training footage just last night, and Tyson Fury, he looks absolutely jacked, clearly taking this one serious, and that's where my money's going next Saturday night. You mentioned the demons that he's had to deal with, that we've all had to deal with at some point in our life. Maybe nobody more than Ryan Garcia recently uh, what do you think the chances are that we get a rematch versus Tank Davis? Because we keep talking about all these big fights. Yeah, Tank took him out and it looked pretty one-sided, but I feel like Ryan Garcia's name is pretty hot. And the weird thing is, at 25 years old, now that he's fighting the biggest names out there, you can't really take a step back if you want to lose interest. I think that if that happens, it's going to be years down the line. Um, I don't think that I think Javante Davis having the win over him where his name is already as hot as it is right now. I think tank is going to kind of latch on to that and, and, and just hold on to it for a little while just to drive Ryan nuts. Um, it's interesting. Obviously he's going on the thing with the, the, the positive test for the ostrich team. I think I got that supplement, right? And where does it stand? Is he going to get cleared of it? Is he not? We have a little bit of a John Jones situation where it's like, well, it's Pico grams. It's, you know, a little bit of this substance. Was it a contaminated substance? You know that whole deal that we have to go through. The difference sure. is with uh, UFC and, and boxing is UFC, when this would happen with USADA, man, you were going to be out for a couple of years. We really don't know what the ramifications are going to be for Ryan Garcia, but it will likely delay whenever he's going to be back in the ring unless he goes and play, fights in, I don't know, like, Mississippi or Tennessee or someplace that'll sanction him that he doesn't have to worry about it. So that's a big leap. There's been some chatter between him and uh, Errol Spence. There's a little drama because Errol Spence is being sued by his uh, his trainer, Derek James. So there's a little bit of a storyline there because Ryan Garcia is now trained by Derek James. So could we see the return of Errol Spence in a matchup against Ryan Garcia? That's kind of an intriguing one as well. You mentioned fight locations. AT&T Stadium in Dallas, Texas will be the location for Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson coming up later on this summer. There's going to be so much money coming in on that fight. Everybody's going to be watching. I know you shake your head. We've been talking about this one now for like two and a half years, kind of laughing at it. But when it, the night that it actually comes and we're talking, that's going to feel like a... I think it's going to feel like an old Mike Tyson, like 1990s type atmosphere. Maybe, obviously, not maybe, for the very last time, only because you would have the complete crossover with, obviously, he's got fans all over the place. So does Jake Paul. They're a lot younger. It's been, it's happening in a football stadium. I ain't going to lie to you, dude. Kind of looking forward to this. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to be a fraud. We're going to be talking about it. We're going to give you all the yeah, bets we- on it. It's very probably morally wrong that a 58-year-old is stepping into a pro-sanctioned it's- fight, but they're tweaking it a little bit. Two-minute rounds, giant-ass gloves. So, you know, I guess that makes us feel a little bit better. But, yeah, listen, Tyson does look good at he's He's not, you know, partaking in nighttime activities, no weed. He seems like he's taking it serious. Hey, don't knock it until you've tried it. There's also a $2 million VIP package. You want to go have these on that for the fight? That's Brendan Tobin on the Sports Machine. Sean Levine here on the BetQL Network. Sean Levine will step into the cage with Brendan Tobin in Are You Gonna Fight Me? I'm gonna fight your ass. Here on Tapped Out. That's right, fight me like a man. Only on the BetQL Network. You know the rules. I want a good, clean fight. When I tell you to break, I want you to step back up my command and break. And I go back to the corner and come out fighting at the bell. Here we go. Two men fighting on your radio. Welcome back into Tapped Out. I always like to get the guy I'm fighting a little bit riled up. So before we officially start the segment, BT, how do you feel about uh, Boston Bruins fans? Oh, dude, I am so (laughs) glad you asked. What a bunch of babies. I mean, my God, this Marshan's trying to goat 
uh, Alexander Barkov into a fight, which, by the way, you can't find anybody less interested in fighting than Alexander Barkov. The guy is a gentleman and a goal scorer and an assister. He's not going to go out there trying to fight you. Just because Kachuk wants to fight anything with a pulse doesn't mean Barky does. And so this guy, he's trying to goad him into a fight. And you want to know what happens? He gets a big old thumping from Sam Bennett, the Lorax, and he went snooze snooze for the rest of the uh, for the rest of the the game. And these Boston Bruins are oh, they're belly aching. How dirty the Panthers are! They keep starting it. I mean, they're like zero for nine in fights in this in the entire in this entire series, and they're whining about the dirty Panthers when they're the ones who are poking the bear. We need more fighting in sports. I, I know that our show talks fighting. We talk boxing. We talk mixed martial arts. We love the UFC. But honestly, like I know I'm not supposed to say this, but it would be so much more entertaining if we had a couple of more bench-clearing brawls in baseball, if we let dudes take their helmet and shoulder pads off like we do in hockey and circle around each other till somebody hits the ground. Like, I'm pro-fighting in sports. Sue me. Look, uh, usually nothing ever happens in most of the sports. Like baseball, right. you'll have guys running in from the bullpen just to stare at each other. Uh, in basketball, I mean, that's probably the worst fighting sport there is because everybody acts like they want to fight and nobody does. But when you get after it in hockey, when they're really about it, whew, especially when things all break loose and there's nothing to play for anymore, it can get crazy. All right, here we go. Segment's called You Gonna Fight Me. Uh, Nate Diaz and Jorge Masvidal are going to box each other at some point. The date changed. I was thinking back to both their respective UFC careers. You're going to fight me if I say... I think Nate Diaz had a little bit better UFC career than Jorge Masvidal. Um, I'm surprised I'm not going to fight you on that. I mean, he, he really? did lose to Jorge pretty clearly, but, I mean, when you beat Conor McGregor at the height of Conor McGregor, that's right. I don't care if you got the coolest knockout of all time. I mean, that is, that's untouchable. I think that his win over Conor McGregor win, uh, rings eternal. That's one of, like, the craziest, most seen wins of all time. Um. You know, and Jorge probably would have had to beat Kamaru Usman to to top that, and he wasn't able to. Both kind of, I don't want to say journeyman careers because they were fan favorites, but they would win, then they would lose. They would go on a couple of fight winning streaks, then they would lose again. I do think you could argue that Masvidal's heights actually ended up more than Nate Diaz because for, I would say, at least a calendar year or two, there wasn't a more popular fighter in the game than Jorge Masvidal. Yeah, no, his his rise, especially after 2019, was insane. It was crazy to, to see a to see a guy who basically you know wasn't main eventing cards to where he was is is absolutely insane. It's absolutely insane. But I think that there is just a different level. I mean, when you, I mean, Grandma saw Nate Diaz beat Conor McGregor. You know, like that's that that was like one of those ones where everybody's talking about it. Everybody remembers where they were when it happened. I was at the brass monkey over here in Lake Worth watching, you know, Nate Diaz getting Conor McGregor to tap. You got a cool grandma, man. Bubby wasn't watching. I can guarantee you that she was asleep. That was way too late for her. Uh, here we go. We're going to see Islam step in the octagon in the next pay-per-view against our guy Dustin Diamond Poirier. You're going to fight me if I say, I actually think that Islam is a more complete, not better, but a more complete fighter than Khabib. Uh, no, I'm not going to fight you on that. I, I definitely think that he's got more tools in the toolbox, but he, you know, like it's like getting mad because Khabib didn't use a hammer when he's got a jackhammer. You know, it's like, <laughs> right. hey, how come you didn't go manual labor on that one, Khabib? It's like because a smish electric. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, like why Why would he try anything different? Nobody could touch him. He'd, you know, bring you up against the cage, trip you, choke you out. That's how it went every single time. But I think it's been interesting, and everybody said this, you know, his coaches have said this, DC has talked about this, that you have a guy who will use his hands a little bit more, and I do think he's a little bit more flawed than Khabib, and that's okay. The fact that we have a guy who's a little bit more vulnerable, but in a ways could probably could be more exciting in some regards because his fights are going to have more pockets for him to lose, and I think that that's fun, that we have a guy who, all right, he's going to go out there, he's going to try and bang with some fighters, but... Hey man, you I mean he he had a fight against Volkanovski, which had everybody questioning him, questioning him, and then comes back. Yeah, he got Volk on ten days' notice, but he head kicked him to hell. So, you know, he's got 
He's got a lot of things that to, to show for himself every time he's in there. I'm actually curious to see if that plays against him in this one, Sean, because as we've seen with Dustin, it does feel like, hey, there's a path to go beat him. There's a way to go get him. You get that rear naked choke against him. He's going to – he'll – he'll leave that there for you if he tries to strike with him and you're going to try and strike with a guy like dustin poirier that really can leave yourself in some bad spots and i i wonder if that if if islam will play into that a little bit too much and if it will cost him i was actually wondering the other way what poirier is going to do because obviously he'd love to keep it on his feet one of if not the best boxer in the entire promotion but also remember that last fight he jumped that guillotine six or seven times and if it gets on the ground islam obviously has the edge poirier though was a stubborn bastard when it came to that in the last fight where i'm thinking all right for some reason he's got set in his head that he's going to sub him i think and you tell me if i'm wrong his only path to victory is knocking out islam i would agree with that i mean unless he actually does hit that out of nowhere but yeah he's gotta it it feels like he's got to catch him he's got to hurt him uh the one thing you can say about Poirier though is even if it does have a rough first round or a rough second round I feel like he carries that with him throughout the fight so I don't think Islam can just say hey I'm gonna tire him out and he's going to be he's gonna be you know gun shy or 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 be easier to beat after tenderizing for no Dustin Poirier in a five-round fight is is dangerous for 25 minutes. Later on this summer, we're going to get Hamzad Jemaya versus Robert Whitaker. You're going to fight me if I say Hamzad Jemaya is overrated. Not to say he won't be a champion, not to say he isn't really good, but I've seen enough to say that he's overrated. Uh, not going to fight you. I think that Hamzad has shown some vulnerabilities, you know, like we, like we were talking with our boy Jason earlier on. Like I think that the guy has shown that he's got some some holes in the game and Robert Whitaker is very very dangerous you know this is a guy who basically only loses to champions or former champions and Hamzat you know you could probably poke a little bit if you want to be a jerk you could poke it like all of his wins outside of Fight Island you know there's just a little something to everyone we're like and Kevin Holland quite he beat up Kevin Holland pretty good yeah 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 but he got I mean like let's be real I'll do it he got Kevin Holland after he was supposed he's, to be fighting Nate Diaz. You're poking. He, he You're was poking. Simply, like he right. completely disregarded the scale. He was like, "What do I get to weigh for this one? One seventy? Right. How about one hundred and eighty-three right. pounds?" Yeah, a little bit overweight. You're right. Now that you break it down, he has had issues. Let's say in every single fight. Am I reading between the tea leaves, or are you putting your money on Robert Whitaker that night? Probably. Probably. Because I, I, I think that, you know, until Robert Whitaker is shown that, like, he's over the hill, he's proven more to me than Hamzad. Because there's no shame in me for him losing to Stylebender. There's no shame in him losing to DDP. Um, and as we've seen, like, you know, guys can, can bounce back from these losses and still be very, very dangerous. Double friend of the show, Robert Whitaker. He's come on with us a couple of separate times before fights. Hopefully we can do that again during fight week. Corey Sandhagen and Umar Nurmagomedov has been announced. That fight's going down August 3rd. Umar puts his O on the line. He's undefeated 17-0 and versus 17-4. Corey Sandhagen, you going to fight me if I say, I think Corey Sandhagen knocks him out. Sandhagen looks awesome recently. Man, it's a tough fight. I actually kind of feel for, for Sandhagen that they're like, Hey, man, right? uh, you know, you, you probably could be fighting for the belt. I mean, like, if he wanted to just sit back and and wait to see who the winner was going to be between Marab and Sean O'Malley, he probably could. He's riding a three-fight win streak. What does he have to go prove right now? But instead, they're just like, why don't you go fight Umar Namagamedov? What do you think about that, dude? And, you know, to his credit, he's going to go out there and do it. This 135 is a shark tank, though. You have to, you have to go prove yourself time and time again. Marab had to do it and did it while Sean O'Malley was probably taken on a less worthy contender in Cheeto Vera, and now it's it's Sandhagen's turn. So he's got a, a huge task to get over it. I don't think he can knock out Umar, dude. I think it, there's definitely a chance he can win by decision, but putting him away like that, that's a tough ask. You remember that flying knee? He can knock dudes out in a bunch of different ways. Obviously, you can sub you, too, talking about Corey Sandhagen. Um, as we move on here, tapped out on the BetQL network, in his prime, Mike Tyson would have knocked out, knocked out Tyson Fury. Fury steps back into the ring next week. You going to fight me? 
Um, yeah, I'm gonna fight you on that one. I still think that Tyson is probably a little bit, too, a little bit too big on that. Um, especially the guy who you know took on Deontay Wilder the second and third fights. But look, I mean, Tyson Fury has shown you that he is chinny. He is, uh, he is able to get got. But that is a big, big size mismatch that he's got to, he's got to go against. And I just feel like. Tyson Fury has shown an ability in some of his better performances to stay out of danger. Um, so if he fought it the right way, I think that he could he could figure out Mike Tyson in that regard. Uh, speaking of heavyweights, we've got one coming up in the main event, UFC St. Louis. That'll probably take place about 20, 30 minutes from now. We'll keep you updated here on the show. Derek Lewis, of course, is half of tonight's main event. You're going to fight me if I say, even though he doesn't have the best record in the world, Derek Lewis is a future UFC Hall of Famer. Yeah, no question. Uh, no, not gonna fight you on that. He's definitely gonna go to the Hall of Fame. Guy's too beloved, um, and and just you know, what, I mean, we're talking most knockouts ever. Like that's kind of one of those things where like you got, well, I guess not anymore. But like back in the day, you had like five hundred home runs, you had three hundred wins, you had three thousand hits. Those used to be like magic numbers in baseball to get you in the Hall of Fame. Like when you have things like most wins of all time, most subs of all time, most knockouts, most heavyweight knockouts. Uh, who's keeping that guy out of the Hall of Fame? It seems ridiculous. Speaking of knockouts, Leon Edwards has one of the most famous in the history of the sport. You're going to fight me if I say, I think there's something weird going on with Leon. I don't know what it is. I have no inside information, but, I mean, last time we heard he was going to fight at UFC 300. In hindsight, half the main event was Jamal Hill. That's just, like, weird. You're going to fight me if I say there's something up with Leon Edwards. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I'm going to fight you. I think that what's weird is the UFC <laughs> isn't that into him being the champion right now. And, uh, you know, especially having him fight Bilal Muhammad. It seems like if you ask Dana White, like, hey, would you rather have this plate of broccoli or watch Bilal Muhammad fight? It seems like the answer for him is give me the broccoli. Like, he he is not into that at all for whatever reason. He is giving Leon Edwards all these options. It ends up getting tabled, and so we got to wait until this Bilal versus Leon Edwards fight becomes uh, official. But I don't think it's a weird thing going on with Leon. I think it's just obvious. The UFC doesn't seem that thrilled with this being the welterweight championship fight, which is kind of weird. Like, you know, they did just headline a pay-per-view with uh, the flyweights. I know that Mighty Mouse got all upset because he's like, oh, this didn't get the love it deserved. But it's going to happen. You're not going to have a – you're not going to – hit these 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 monster home runs every single time with a paper there's going to be some ones that are a little bit more clunky like you know just have the fight in manchester put leon and and Bilal in the co-main and then have aspen all fight whoever he's going to fight for that there you go. weird interim not not the undisputed for whatever reason not the undisputed heavyweight championship have him fight whoever he's going to fight and let's just get to it come on rock come on rocky you got this one rock i mean I think you just did the matchmaking for Dana. That makes a lot of sense, although kind of an insult to put them on a co-main instead of letting those guys headline a card. But I'm with you. Who's going to buy it? And then I think back to what you just mentioned about last week's pay-per-view. Let's just call it what it is. Ursig versus Pantoja. No disrespect. The fight was fun. I think Ursig got screwed a little bit with only being ranked number nine right now. All that being said, as far as headlining a pay-per-view card, maybe the weakest that we've ever seen out of the 302 that we've had or 301 to this point. It was, it was up there. Like I'm not, and I, I don't think it's anything against those guys. I just think it's like Ursig. They just kind of ran out. They're at that spot where they're like, Hey, flywitz, what do we do here? And they're like, well, Ursig was cool last time around. And, and to be fair, he had a really great performance. I do think he has an argument that he won that fight for sure. Um, so I think that's great. Like it'll lead to, the next matchup, whenever that happens, being uh, being highly anticipated. But, you know, also, I think their problem was like, hey, we gave you 300, 299, 298. Those were all That's really it. good cards. That's it. That's the real problem. 299 was too good. I know it was in Miami, so you're the one that benefited from that being octagon side. But, dude, they could have gave us a couple of those fights last week. 299 was too good. 300 was awesome. 301, eh, not so much. 302, though. Islam and Poirier, we got a couple of good fights on that card. Coming up on the other side, we break down all the happenings in the world of fighting this week, right here on the BetQL Network. And Sean Levine on the BetQL Network.
Appreciate you checking us out this Saturday night. BT and the Sports Machine here talking fighting with you on the BetQL Network. It's a fun Saturday night if you like action. You got some NHL playoffs. You got some NBA playoffs. You got UFC St. Louis. We'll get you caught up on that here in just a second. Vasilya Lomachenko back in the ring for the first time in a while. So depending on your sport, chance to make some money at BetMGM. Um, I mentioned the St. Louis car. We're still waiting on a couple of fun fighters. Joaquin Buckley yet to fight. Of course, half of the main event is the Black Beast, Derek Lewis. This has been a fun fight card so far. Like, compared to what we saw last week, we were talking a little bit of smack about 301. There have been some fun fights and still some fun fighters yet to come. Yeah, it's been a good card. It's been a little bit of a... Uh... A lackluster main card thus far, but because before that, I mean, and, and to be fair, like coming into the last two undercard fights into the main card, they, I mean, they were just absolute fire. So um, we did get a big time fraud exposure from Robeles de Spagne, uh, Waldo Cortez Acosta. He accosted him because he basically <laughs> took him down for 13 seconds into this fight and Dude, it was it was uh it was crazy that he basically just took him down 13 seconds into every round of that fight and nearly finished him. Nearly had a submission, nearly nearly had a ground and pound, but he ends up getting the uh, decision. So, Despagne after we were talking about, he had spent basically a uh, a total of 90 seconds in his last four fights. Uh well, he got some he got some round experience today, but most of it was on his back. And then uh, Sean Woodson gets the win over Caceres. Uh, I had a 2-1 for Woodson. Uh, one judge had it uh, had it 3-0, but he gets the unanimous decision. So uh, no, no no quibbling with that one. I think that was, that was a uh, pretty clear decision for Woodson in that one. Let's talk some other news this week in the world of mixed martial arts. The GOAT John Jones confirms that Stipe is going to be his next fight. I think we all saw that coming. You talked about earlier. At one point, Pereira was in his mouth. At one point, it was Aspinall before that. It was Francis Ngannou. We've heard a lot of different potential opponents. It feels like at this point, and tell me if you feel differently, if John Jones ever fights in the UFC again, it's versus Stipe. And if that one doesn't happen, I don't think we ever see him again. Yeah, I can't rule that out. I, I, this has been what he's been saying the whole time. I think that there's always a little bit of a worry because, you know, Stipe's old. What if he just decides to hang it up? But John is injured that happen too. And, and is trying to uh, to come out. But I don't necessarily have a problem with them making this the sunset fight right off into the sunset. But here's the thing with it, Sean, is if Stipe wins, he's very clearly going to retire if John wins, it doesn't sound like he's that keen on fighting uh, Tom Aspinall. Like, I know he's talked about it, but very clearly he has a preference. So I guess at that point, why not just drop the belt? We know what they're fighting for. Like, this is a goat fight. Make it for the, We're making a belt, right? BMF belt has got a little more shine. Make it the goat belt. I'm gonna put a little gold goat on it, and go. the winner gets it, and, and that's it. But... I think this idea that we're holding up the heavyweight division and you're not going to fight Aspinall and there's a young division. This isn't the, this isn't the PGA. There's not a senior tour. You're going in there. You either fight the top guys if you're ready or you don't. And Aspinall, they have in this weird slot where like, all right, great. He's going to fight Surreal Gone, who's lost to John Jones. Well, he can fight Gone, but then he can't fight Aspinall. Like, it's a little bit weird for me, man. So I'm not trying to... Uh, Poo poo on John Jones' legacy. Like the guy's done it all. If he wants that fight and he wants, cool. I have no problem with him wanting the Steve Bay fight, but does it have to be for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world? It's very clearly disputed. When would you strip the belt off John Jones? Because I would have already done it. It's pretty obvious that he's only got one guy that he'll fight in Stipe. I don't want to say he's scared of Aspinall, but he's basically turned that fight down. UFC would love to actually see that fight, but it's because of John that it's not going to happen. Talking about an injury, more than a year off. I mean, why is this guy still technically champion anyway? I don't think they're going to strip him. I don't think they're going to strip him. I think that why? he is because I think that they want that being on the line like you have the arguably the greatest heavyweight champion of all time in Stipe Miocic versus John or at Stipe's what well, that would make him a three-time heavyweight champion I believe if he yep. were to beat John Jones so 
you know, I get it. It has been over a year, but it's not like if he is going to be planning on fighting November, it's not a crazy amount of time. But I just think it's a little strange that like Aspinall's kind of hanging in the wind here. And he's not, you know, Aspinall's not gonna be sitting here and be like, oh, this is great. I get to just sit by and wait and figure it out. Because then if John if you're Aspinall, you're cool with it as long as eventually you get the John Jones fight. But how does he have any assurances that's gonna happen? Assurances? I think it's like 20%. I don't think it's a good likelihood that, that fight happens at all. Aspinall would love it because that would really, I would say, begin his legacy as a heavyweight champion. Because you look at the rest of the landscape right now, even if he was to say, okay, I'll go down to light heavyweight and try to become champ champ, or whatever, there's not a bunch of names out there. Like, you think a Pereira fight would be awesome, and that'd be a whole lot of fun if those guys got together. But John Jones doesn't need Tom Aspinall for his legacy. Obviously, it's already submitted. Would you agree that Aspinall kind of needs to fight John Jones? I don't think he needs to fight John Jones, but certainly it would skyrocket him. Oh yeah, it would definitely skyrocket him. I mean, who wouldn't want to take on somebody of his of his credentials? But you know, you to your point, there's not a lot of guys in this heavyweight division because he's already knocked out the scariest guy. Like he already took out Pavlovich and diced through him. So like, if he beats Surreal Gone, I think everybody's already on Surreal Gone. Like, nah. We, we we're on to you. Like we thought you were going to maybe be the truth, but you couldn't out grapple Francis Ngannou. You got ragdolled by John Jones. He is what he is. You know, he's really good, but I don't think he's this like next beacon. The Curtis blades one is still an important fight for him because of his knee getting injured, but it's Curtis blades. Like I think for the most part, he's very talented, but he's kind of lived in the top five. He's a lifetime contender. He's never been champion. Um, then who's the next guy that impresses you, man? Like, I'm giving you the rankings right now. Gon is two. Pavlovich is yeah. three. Blades is four. Stipe is five. Volkov is six. Yeah. Um, Gilton Almeida, I don't think has, you know, has, has lit the world on fire like everybody thought that he was going to. Then you're talking about Tybora and Tai Tuivasa is the 10th. And Tai Tuivasa is ranked 10th? Holy crap. I mean, when's the last time Tai Tuivasa won a fight? Like, that just kind of shows you the state of where we're at right now. Precisely. There's not a bunch of uh, big names right now at heavyweight, which is kind of why I was saying for, for uh, Aspinall, it, it, he doesn't need him because he's still young, but it would be huge if he would ever get that fight versus John Jones. I mentioned the light heavyweight division. There's a rumor that Yuri Prohoshka and Alex Pereira are going to go at it. Where would your money go in that one, assuming that Pereira is probably going to go off as like a minus 180, minus 200 favorite? I think there's a number where I could be convinced to throw a little something on Yuri. I don't know what that number is because uh, I feel like if it does start off at like a minus 180, I feel like more money is going to even come in on on Poetan for that fight. Yuri's just wild, man. Like I just I think that there's something to just sprinkling a little something on him to get it by knockout in that fight at some point just because he'll do some wild samurai thing, you know, throw like, you know, an inverted axe kick while doing some capoeira flip or something like that. That's you never right. know what he's going to do. And then it's like, ah, you know, and I got that. And I got, you know, axe kick flying knee by, you know, plus 800 just because, you know, like I think there's just something fun to betting on your project. His last fight against Rockets was crazy. Losing that basically entire fight and then just bang out of nowhere, just flips it and and and, and is able to get the win. Uh, Pajeda is probably the scariest thing in the sport right now. Probably the scariest hands we've seen since Francis Ngannou. But, um, Yuri, I just think there's value in that. And Pajeda can get got. Ask Izzy. Like, we've yep. seen him get knocked out before, so it's not completely crazy. Verbally, Patty Pimblett and Renato Moicano have agreed on a fight, although earlier today, Chase Hooper looked awesome, and then he called out Patty Pimblett. If we see Patty versus Moicano, I assume you think it would be the same result for Patty that he get pieced up? You just be yes, but but Moicano's rolling right now, dude. Like Money yeah. Moicano has has dipped himself in the in the waters of rejuvenation, and like is just just he's rebranded himself. Everybody loves Money Money Moicano and everything that he brings to the table. So yeah, I just think that he's riding high right now. I am glad that we're getting to a point uh, where Patty's getting, I guess, a tougher test. 
And if he gets past this, maybe Chase Hooper will be next, uh, it seems, or maybe he'll be a stand-in if this case is fight, uh, if something happens to Hanato Moicano. But I like that fight. I'm glad that uh, that Patty Pimblett's actually uh, stepping in there with somebody who can give him the business. Now, that would be a fight if somehow they said, screw you, Patty. We still want to see more from you. Moicano, you got to take on Chase Hooper after Chase Hooper. Just beat the brains out of that dude. I actually... Actually, was, I was going to say I'd lean Chase Hooper, but then I remember Moicano. I don't even know what the odds would look for in that fight because both those guys look great right now. I think Moicano would be a pretty heavy favorite in that one because I do think there's a little element to uh, to Chase where I don't think people really believe in the striking. I mean, the the the, the even the knockdown that he had today was pretty. Uh, it was a wild one, like just out of nowhere. But uh, but man, he's only 24 years old, and we've seen these guys. They're just getting better every uh, every time you get in there. This kid, like, you know, literally was, like, fighting for titles at 19 years old in regional promotions, gets to the UFC at 20, you know. So, of course, he's going to fill out to his body a little bit more. He he looks absolutely dangerous. Speaking of dangerous, Conor McGregor, when he's right, one of the most dangerous to ever step inside the octagon. Some footage has come out of him boxing. Looks really, really good. Hands look like they used to. He bought a stake in BKFC over the weekend. Any concern that for this upcoming fight versus Michael Chandler, he's just getting pulled in too many directions. Because when Conor was great, he was just a fighter. And now he's got the booze and he's got the acting and he's got all these different things. Any concern if you're actually betting on McGregor that he's being stretched too thin and he's not the old notorious? Um, this, You know, more so like when he was doing the movies. I don't think this really concerns me because BKFC – already has a pretty sharp operation at how they're going, you know, with, with Feldman, you know, running the whole thing. He's got his matchmaker. So I don't think Connor's going to be really doing much other than maybe showing up to a couple of fights. And then even the ones where he's in training camp, probably just posting on Instagram and, you know, to be KFC's credit, they have done a marvelous job of, of, of handling how they do these things on social media. You know, even with like having somebody like Paige Van Zant, you know, who, what did she do? Two fights for them, and but she's still associated with the sport and will publicize the sport, and you know. So I think it's cool. I, I actually like the fact that Connor is uh, is is going to have some roots in combat sports. It seems perfect for him because there is, if you ever go to a BKFC event, there is like a lineage too of like old bare knuckle fighting, which kind of seems like it sticks right with Ireland, right? Uh, they got like the old tiny guy with a handlebar mustache. He did, I swear to God. And then he's got like the old uh, belt on top of the BKFC belt. No way. So I swear to God, I swear to God, dude, I used to vote for BKFC. I was in, I was in the, I, I voted for the rankings, and then I just, I'm like, I got to be honest with you, dude. I'm watching Heat games. I'm not watching every BKFC. I, <laughs> I, I feel bad voting for these, but um, I like it for Connor. I like it. I think it's perfect for him, and uh, I don't worry that this stretches him too thin. You know, the movies. The extracurriculars of of whatever he's doing when not training, that would worry me more. And really, honestly, Sean, what worries me more than anything is just his recovery. We have not seen guys come off of this injury and look that great. So I hope that health-wise, he is able to give you a viable performance. Dream with me here for a second. Let's say he comes out, looks like the old Conor McGregor. It lasts around. He knocks out Michael Chandler cold. He tells us, I'm back, baby. Probably not in those words. Surprise, surprise. And what's next? Like, what would be the best possible fight for a belt or otherwise? Like, what would be the dream scenario? I think, in a weird way, it would be Islam takes out Dustin, and then we see Islam fight Conor McGregor. Just because it, it's like a chance to avenge all the Khabib stuff. If you ask me, if Conor wins, what's the best, biggest possible fight for him? That's what I'd say. Maybe Max? I don't know. There's a bunch of them. Yeah, hard to argue. I mean, look, Islam has all the drama. The only thing I worry with him is, like, can Connor make 155 pounds anymore? Like, the dude looks like an absolute muscled-up moose, so can he sure. make that happen? But I agree with you. Drama-wise, in a perfect world, even if Islam were to come up and get the 170 strap and they could do that eventually, yeah, I, I think that that's the biggest fight. Max, to me, is probably second just because of he's riding high right now, especially if he's able to beat Taporia. Obviously, they wouldn't fight for the belt, but still, it would just be a monster fight. Dustin, I feel like we've kind of been there, done that. I don't think that that has uh, the same luster. You know, could him versus uh, Leon, you know, that's a fun stylistic fight. I don't know if it's got a lot of drama behind it, but it's a fun stylistic fight. 
if Dustin was to win, though, I think there's still a little bit of juice left in that orange. Like, only because the last time that we saw Connor, it was against that guy, and both dudes would be coming off of a win. So, I don't know. Maybe there'd be a little bit of interest. Not like there was the first or certainly the second time around. I agree the third time that whole thing got a little bit messy. Coming up on the other side, we put a bow on this show. It is tapped out right here on the BetQL Network. All this old baseball talk during the commercial break. No love for Pete Incavilia, boys. His name didn't come up. All right. That's fine. Uh, welcome back a, into the show. Yes, you got something the, to say? What? You got an old is Marlin, that a Roy, is Juan it Pierre, Royal? perhaps? Dude. What about uh, Juan Pierre? Jim, Jim Eisenreich? Oh, yeah. I love it. J- uh, Juan Pierre banged the drum at the Panthers game the other day because, you know, that's their thing. You bang the drum before the game. And uh, they had Juan Pierre there. Crowd goes nuts. Love, JP. Who knew? You did, apparently. Um, all right, welcome back into the show. Final segment of Tapped Out. That's Brendan Tobin. I'm the sports machine, Sean Levine. Let's welcome in our trusty producer, Jake Noaker. Before we get into a segment called What Are the Odds? You were pretty vocal this week about uh, John Jones getting stripped of his title. BT says it won't happen. I'm leaning more towards you. Like, dude, it's been long enough. I know you're the GOAT, but at some point, dude, they got to take that belt off your waist. I mean, it says right in the rules, the interim champion, once they win the belt, their next fight will be the champion for a unification belt. I love John Jones, man. I love John Jones, but dude, give up the belt. I have no problem with you fighting Stipe, but don't hold up the whole division. Jeez. You're, you're BT, adorable. I I wanna... You were the rule guy on this show. Who knew? I want to pinch his cheeks. First of all, like we got to follow the rules for John Jones. Do they moved a card out of a state for him one time? That's true. Like they've never bent the rules for John Jones. Second of all, the interim title, like they went away from the rules the second like Colby Covington was fighting for an interim title because they couldn't wait a month for Tyron Woodley. And they're like, oh, yeah, you fight for the interim title, Colby. The, but then the next month, Tyron Woodley, you fight for the real belt. And then eventually you guys will fight for the belt. Like, what? That, that makes no sense. They've broken those rules and uh, right over their knee. Like, I get you, man. I, if I was Tom Aspel, I'd be annoyed too. But you know they're going to – they're dying to get that one fight in. They're dying to do it. The interim title has lost a little bit of, I think, its original intention, as Jake points out, that if a guy's hurt, we'll give it to somebody else to not hold up the division. And then once Duke can come back, they'll fight each other. But at this point, it's just, hey, we have to call somebody champion because we're trying to make a lot of money and sell these pay-per-views. So we'll give out a bunch of belts. All right, let's do a segment called What Are the Odds? Boys, let's start with you, BT. What are the odds that one day Bo Nickel is a UFC champion? I think the I think they're pretty damn good. I mean, the guy doesn't seem like he has a whole lot of weaknesses. Like he dominates a guy and then is like, I'm sorry, that wasn't dominant enough. Um, my only question with him is my is always weird of like he's not super young. So like when does he wanna make that jump to start going through everybody? Cause some guys will slow roll it and some guys will just go, you know, right into it and and try and take their crack. Look at Ersig last week. They'll be like, oh, title right, right away? Sign me up. The Hata, right into the, the fire, sign me up. And then some guys want to be on the O'Malley train. I don't know what's right or wrong because we've seen they can be successful both ways. Um, but talent-wise, yeah, I think that he's got all the makings of it. Bo Nichols, 28? How is that possible? Bo, what? I thought he got out of college yesterday. Bo Nichols, 28 years old? Uh, Jake, did you mean to spit into your microphone when I asked that question? Yeah, I was laughing. He's never going to be oh. champion. Get out of here, man. <laughs> what? Really? He's going to get fraud checked soon, guys. He's going to. How? What have you seen that nobody else has? I don't even know what you're talking about. Dude, he's four or five fights into his MMA career. He's already 28 years old. He hasn't even scratched the surface of the top 25, let alone the top 15. Cody Brundage is his best win uh no i don't think he's going to win a title by the time he's fighting contenders he'll be 30 31 32 seven eight fights in i i'm just i'm not about it man not about it you're gonna, you're gonna eat those words i bet he gets a shot against like hamza with the next calendar year ragdolls him and then we make you come back and say i was wrong because bo nickel i'm like 73 percent sure that one day he'll be champion and he's got hands obviously he can grapple he's as good of a credentialed wrestler as we've ever seen now what are you saying bt what's your problem 
We don't, I think to Jake's point, we don't really know if he has hands, but I would say it's tougher. Like we saw with Despagne today, right? Like it's tougher to get fraud checked when you are that good a grappler. Cause you're always, it, it, when you're that, when you're that above everybody else, like you're going to have a safety blanket, you know, that, that, that you wouldn't, if you're striking specialty, like everybody's got the nest to go to. Right. So it's going to be tougher to find the blueprint against Bo nickel than it will against other guys. Uh, I don't really know how good his hands are, but I just think that, you know, look, somebody needs to have a hater. I'm glad that Jake is the guy, you know, like he, Seriously. He, that, uh, he, we can't have everybody giving you flowers. You're going to need to prove it against somebody, right? Let, let's start with producer and hater Jake Noaker here with this one. Uh, Jake, what are the odds that the Sugar Show Sean O'Malley is ever a champ champ, two division champion? I That's more reasonable. That's possible. He's a big okay. 135 or as is. He's already talking some smack up there at 145 with uh, Ilya. So maybe, maybe down the line. But I think it's more likely he's a Bantamweight champion and a boxing champion, something along those lines. Not a legitimate boxing belt, but, a, you know, a celebrity type of fake fan belt type thing. BT, I know Champ Champ isn't your favorite thing, although O'Malley's always kind of tried to be not the next McGregor, but the same way that Kobe and LeBron tried to emulate a lot of the stuff that Jordan did. So I think to be Champ Champ for O'Malley is important. What are the odds it actually happens? Um, I think that I honestly think his biggest obstacle to it's probably coming up with Marab because if he gets by Marab, I think I'm okay with him taking on whatever the winner is between him and uh, between Holloway and Taporia. That's a great fight. I mean, who's going to, who's going to not want to tune into that. And he's obviously a very good striker. Neither one of those guys are going to have a real stylistic thing that I think holds him back. Um, and man, I think honestly, Tapori would be cool, but sugar Sean versus Max Holloway outside of McGregor fight. There's not many fights that are bigger than that right now. That would be amazing. Let's go down that path, Jake. What do you think the chances are? What are the odds that Max Holloway ever gets an actual shot to fight for the belt again? Because to me, it feels like just said, Pat, maybe win another fight. And I think the UFC would actually love to see him be champ. What say you? I think it helps a lot that Volk lost to Ilya. I think Ilya right? being the champ makes that a lot more possible. A lot of people are saying Ilya Max could be next. I think Ilya Sean are talking. Ilya has a lot of options. He's really taking his time choosing. But I think Max Holloway could be fighting for a belt much sooner than later. BT Max champ? Uh, it's definitely, I think it's a, a great chance of it happening just because, first of all, you have a performance like that against Justin Gaethje, who is already the basically the number one lightweight contender. Max has a great argument to fight the winner of Islam versus Dustin Poirier right away if he wanted to. I I get it. Volk could claim, hey, I was the reigning champ. I've beaten Max Holloway, so I deserve any shot before he does. I understand that, but also I really would like to see Volkanovski take some time off because that's always going to be there for him. I just want him to be healthy and recovered by the time that comes back. So you really could argue that Max Holloway is the number one contender sure. in two divisions right now. And so Crazy. I think that I think that's a, it's a it's a good chance. I think I'd probably lean, you know, Taporia being the the more likely one that he would win against as opposed to Islam, but man, I, I you can't rule anything against Max Holloway. The guy's the guy's one of the all-time greats. BT, uh speaking of all-time greats, Colby's last fight was not. It was one of the all-time stinkers and if he was a stock, it'd be as low as possible. What are the odds that Colby Covington is ever really relevant in the UFC scene again? Um, I think the odds are good just because Ooh. he always seems like he's relevant. Like that's the one thing you could say with Colby is he's such a master at like waiting it out for the perfect opportunities. He's an opportunist. Some might say like he's, he's never, you're never going to get him to fight on anybody else's terms, but his, uh, and even perfect example of this Ian Gary beef. Like I don't really have a huge interest in the fight stylistically. I don't really see why Ian Gary wants this fight or why this is the beef to go to. And, but they have found something here that has sparked a back and forth on social media. And a lot of people will care about it. Once Colby, uh, once Colby and him get into the, the buildup for it. So 
he does a masterful job of keeping himself relevant, man. I, I don't, I, I, that I don't think is a problem. Will he ever be champion again? No, no, but he will keep himself relevant. 